Hello, I am Deb Coviello, the Drop-In CEO, and I want to thank you for joining us on another amazing episode where week after week, I have these fantastic guests that I bring on to the show who share their life's journey, but also share amazing insights. And along the way, I do hope they inspire you. And I only ask of you to, when we're done, if you really value this episode, share it with somebody else so we can lift the collective if you found this valuable. But on a personal note, just know I am here to help the C-suite leader of today and tomorrow to navigate your challenges with confidence. And today I'm honored to have with me Michael Steer, who is a hands-on C-level executive and a 35 plus year track record of growing companies to scalable and profitable stages. He is a former two-time entrepreneur of technology enabled businesses, and he brings a broad base of expertise and business experience to his current role with Focus CFO clients. And he helps to guide clients in strategy, entrepreneurship, financial management, exit planning, we're gonna go there, and many other things he's gonna tell his whole backstory. Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you, Deb. It's fantastic to be here. So a quick shout out, Chuck, Chuck Cooper. Thank you so much. Chuck. You're an amazing networker introducing me to Michael. Um, every, every person he introduces me to is absolutely amazing. And I bring them on to the show. Um, but Michael also is a Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute grad. We're both grad. We're both geeks. We're going to go there a little <laughs> bit. Uh, <laughs> and so I said, ah, I, and we just hit it off. So we're going yeah. to, we're going to have a great conversation, Michael, but just thank you for joining us today. And I would love for you just to introduce yourself a little bit to our audience, anything personal or about your career journey, because it's very interesting. Wow. Uh, career journey. That's interesting. So you mentioned we're RPI grads. So if you, if you think about my arc, I started with my degree in computer and systems engineering, and my arc is now taking me to being CFO services for small businesses. So that's quite a twist and turn along the way and being a two-time entrepreneur. So it's a uh, no shortage of things maybe to talk about? Yeah, well, I'll go there because it's interesting. So how did you go from being an engineer to all of a sudden owning your own company? And I'm sure there's a little bit in between and then taking a detour and going into a CFO role. I mean, uh, some people just stay in one lane their whole life and others zigzag <laughs> or arrive at places you never expect. So what about you? You know, sometimes in life, you just, you know, you take opportunities that kind of fly by or fly in. Uh -huh. as you go through that. And that's been my arc. I started my career as basically a technology consulting uh, consultant in financial services. Um, a lot of years in New York doing that, which then brought me down to Charlotte as a technology executive for one of the big banks um, down here in North Carolina. And then finally from there, left there, realized that entrepreneurship was really kind of in my blood and being in a large institution was really not conducive to that. So left there and went entrepreneurial, started up, would you expect, a fintech type business um, here in Charlotte and ran that for about 18 years before we finally had our own exit out of that and sold it to a strategic buyer. Along the way, I was, besides the CEO, I was the CFO for the business. Um, and not that that necessarily brought me to my current gig with Focus CFO, but it certainly was the connector that kind of got me there. So it's just, it's just opportunities that kind of present themselves and sometimes they work out, sometimes they won't, but this, this has been working out fantastic. So what is it in yourself that you worked in the, you know, fine companies, large corporations, and then you said, you know, I was really an entrepreneur at heart. What are those characteristics? Because I want people to hear that because if they are kind of uncomfortable, mm -hmm. they feel like a square peg in a, in a, a circle hole and they're just getting, they, they just don't fit. And what was it about you that says, I'm going to do this and believe and trust in yourself to be able to do it? Oof, that's a pretty introspective question. Um, well, it's my show. I can ask those questions. Yes, yes you can. <laughs> um, you know, it, 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 I guess it's innate to my personality uh -huh. to want to drive things to different, better places. I've been mm -hmm. described as a rogue. Um, I've been described... As you, are you familiar with Patrick Lencioni and the Table Group and their inner working geniuses? I'm not, please. No, so I have a, I have a, I did with, that's one of the many different profile type things I've done over, over my career. And I had kind of had this kind of almost um, uh, bifurcated um, or schizophrenic kind of personality where my two strengths are one, 
innovation. And, and the other one is discernment, which almost seem like counterintuitive or maybe you know tugging on each other. But they seem to work as far as um, wanting to push things forward, but also being really thoughtful about how you do that and when you do it. So that's how it works. Okay, well, that's good to know because there's a couple people in my network right now that very, very talented senior level executives, and they're in the, they're not in the right place anymore, and so I've been trying to gently push, trying to push them out of the nest to, you know, go out on their own, maybe become a CEO of a company or mm-hmm. start their own, and there's just just mindset things of like I'm not sure, I can't do that. They got their wife, they got other people saying you should do it, and and they're holding themselves back. They don't trust themselves. You trusted yourself, or were you a little insane and saying <laughs> we're gonna give this a try <laughs> um, you, you know the answer is probably a little bit of both <laughs> all right but, I, i'm comfortable making decisions on partial information and just being you know i guess confident in myself that i'll make it work out somehow oh those are great attributes so you were started your own company i'm sure it wasn't well i'm going to ask you two questions it's a journey i'm still on my journey and there's probably different levels of um, success or I've arrived or I've got something. What was it like when you said, ah, I have a viable product or service here. I'm providing value because it can be lonely, the journey of a CEO or an entrepreneur. Be very lonely. And it's never a straight line progression. Mm -hmm. Um, In fact, the business that we originally launched out with crashed and burned. It was a, it was not such a great business idea at the time, but we pivoted and we pivoted successfully. We identified, there was enough about what we did originally that garnered some interest, but in directions or from ang- from market angles that we hadn't thought about at the time. We okay. took that feedback in and said, hmm, this didn't work, but here we're seeing an opportunity here. We just kind of turn it 98 degrees and kind of head off in that direction. It may be better. And that's ultimately what worked out for, for my business. That's now, um, even then it was yeah. not that easy, but you know, we, we made it work. You know what that does? It gives me a little bit of confidence. So I, in my role, I'm the drop in CEO. I'm also mm-hmm. one who's trying to provide insight to leaders, whether you're in the C-suite or not. And I'm just trying to reach, I'm just trying to find people. And I believe my messaging is good, but I don't think I have enough people with eyeballs on this. So this I've now segued into YouTube. I'm starting to post the video of these things because there might be nothing wrong with what I'm doing to your point, but just changing it a little bit and maybe reaching people in a different way. And it's fun experimenting and seeing what pops. It is fun. (laughs) So crash and burn, or again, this is a vulnerable moment. Tell me a little bit though about the journey where maybe you did have some challenges and how did you get through it? Because look, again, a lot of people hold themselves back from even taking the step to being in a role like yours, fearing failure or feeling the, fearing those challenges. Tell me what was it like? What was some of the challenges you did have and how did you get through it? Uh, there's no short of challenges. Mm-hmm. You know, in the early stage of most entrepreneurs, I would think, is that you, know, you launch a business, you have you, what you think is sufficient resources, perhaps, mm-hmm. to get it launched. And then along the way, you figure out hey, the direction wasn't quite on target and it's probably going to take a lot more than what we have to start with. And so I went through um, some very long times where, you know, you know, classic entrepreneurial story. Am I going to make payroll you know, each month right, for my employees? Where that's going to, you know, are, we, are we doing enough to be able to not only garner customers, but keep them as we continue to, continue to evolve the program? So I lost years of sleep and hair along the way as we kind of figured that out we were we i were fortunate is that you know my business was um venture backed and we had even from the first crash and burn version of our of our business where they had faith in myself and in the you know the other leadership team they kind of figure it out and so they took a bit of a flyer with us um as we were pivoting the business um, you know, they made you know some shrewd financial bets along the way, which ultimately paid off for them. But it was it was kind of that faith in kind of the core group to kind of figure it out um, that ultimately gave us the backing that we needed to be able to pivot and turn around and execute. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm, very, I'm forever grateful for that. Otherwise, we never would have made it. 
There's so many important points that you just made in that. But <laughs> if you're going out on a limb, are you going out on your own? Do you have the right people around you? Absolutely. Because, um, I mean, you are the visionary leading or helping to execute it. But um, just having faith. I mean, I <laughs> my husband, oh, my, does he have all the faith in the world? <laughs> he doesn't poke too much, but he is the most supportive person out there. So whether it's a significant other or a board of advisors, so critical to venture out on your own. But first, you have the confidence. So I want to move now into the work that you're doing and how you're impacting clients. Just tell me a little bit what then you said you sold or exited your business. How did you wind up getting into the fractional CFO space and now with Focus CFO? So to be completely honest, when I sold the business, you know, I was done. So I was, I was, it'd been a long time. I was ready for whatever my next chapter is. I honestly didn't know what that was going to be um, mm -hmm. in a clue. And so and, I'd gone in a couple of different directions. I, you know, joined an advisory board, you know, for a couple of small tech startups, was doing some mentoring, just trying to, you know, staying in the game, trying to kind of figure it out a little bit. Focus CFO found me. And we started talking at first, like fractional CFO services. I'm a technology guy. Um, but as I, as we started talking, it kind of made more and more sense for me or, or, or checking the boxes. My former business was a B2B. We, you know, our clients were small, mid-sized private businesses around the country. I loved interacting with those business owners, understanding what their unique business model was, their niche, their growth strategy. How are they trying to get scalability in their business? Were we a good partner for each other? You know, could we help them get there? And if the answer was yes, they became clients. If no, I would, you know, coach them in different directions to consider. I love that aspect of it. And so... As I started to think about this role at Focus, I'm really doing that now um, in a big way, and more so, working with small, mid-sized own owners of small, mid-sized businesses. But now it's across industries. It's not a single vertical, which was what my business was prior. It's still entrepreneurial, which is fantastic. You get to add a lot of value to what they're doing. But on the positive side, I no longer have to be on a plane every other week. I no longer have to, I, I no longer have scores of employees myself that I need to worry about. I no longer need to deal with private equity guys on my board anymore. So all the stuff that was giving me, you know, stress in my old business is gone. And now it's just pure joy, really. I really enjoyed this role. This is probably the most fun gig I've ever had in my career. <laughs> and so have I. I got out of corporate, the uh, a person that's going to be on my show called themselves corporate escapee. So I'm taking that little mm -hmm. line from them too. So, I mean, we, we gain so much experience from those higher level responsibilities, but I will tell you, I am having the most fun right now, yeah. dropping into businesses, seeing my <laughs> clients deer in the headlight and say, don't worry, I got this, you know? So we're kindred spirits there. I, mean, I know that's why thing. we got, <laughs> we have to add you on the show. Yeah. So, so I want to talk to you a little bit about CFO value because sometimes people just think, oh, they're the be the bean counters and the no say the naysayers to, you know, business owners being able to do what they want. I even talked to a client recently and I think they could potentially do more. So when we think about the bean counters versus <laughs> the value add of a fractional CFO, what exactly is it that you do to provide value to that leadership or that leader or leadership team? You know, it's funny you ask the question that way, the being counter of receiver. One of the biggest early challenges I have in work in talking with business owners is that they don't understand the difference. They don't understand what a CFO does. You say CFO and they think accounting. Accounting and finance are two completely different things. I mean, obviously depending on each other. Accounting is essentially a backward looking function. How did my business do? What did we do last month, last quarter, last year? Generate some financial reports, all that kind of thing. The CFO role, the finance role is a forward looking thing. We use a metaphor of, you know, the, are you driving it through your rear view mirror or are you driving out your front windshield? That's what the CFO does. You know, so you probably saw one of my other, I guess I did, we, we, so we make a joke about the Woody, the old fashioned station wagon, you know, with the wood panels. You know, the, C, you know, the accountant, your bookkeeper, your CPA, or the folks sitting in the back seat looking out the rear window, telling you, great job, telling you where you've been. The CFO's in the front seat with the, with the owner, navigating where they want to go, or sometimes, maybe often, questioning, do we really want to go there or do we want to go there, right, as far as the business? 
That's the difference. The CFO, you know, in a lot of ways is the co-pilot to the business or the CEO for the business. Mm. A lot of times, and I hear this a lot from my clients, is that besides doing just all the financial management and forward looking forecasting, all those things, is just a partner to bounce stuff off. Do we really mm. want to being a business owner? I mean, I know this, and you know, it's a really lonely job because you don't, you know, you have lots of you may have a few employees, you may have a lot of employees, but they're doing the stuff that should be doing in the business. They're not there just to kind of brainstorm and think and bounce things off of because they're thinking about in terms of what does it mean for me? Am I still got my job or whatever? Whereas we come in as fractional CFOs, we're in we're voices, we're independent voices. We're voices of experience because all of our CFOs have been CFOs for decades. So they've been there, they've seen a lot. And so they're just a trusted advisor that the owner feels comfortable bouncing stuff off of, you know, and, and mm. fighting on, hey, this is where I really want to go or whatever it is. So it's, it's really, it's a fun role. You know, and I talked about having joy in what I'm doing. Yeah. One of my favorite parts of the week is toward the end, I, I get just regular updates from my CFOs about what's going on in their clients. And I hear their enthusiasm about how they're adding value to their clients and we did this, we did that, whatever. And I, I enjoyed it. I walked downstairs. My wife can tell if I had a good phone call with the CFO because I have this kind of, I guess I have this grin on my face. Um, I have one of those phone calls. You know, I share that joy with you because also I have been a fractional chief operations officer to mm -hmm. a company or to a CEO. And from an operations perspective, when talking about the talent or the processes, they've opened up to me. They've yeah. asked me questions. I'm not sure how to deal with this particular situation. Mm -hmm. Can you coach me? Can you moderate? And it's a wonderful thing realizing that, you know, they, they've ex noticed their vulnerabilities, their, their blind steps. They've asked for uh, questions and they've evolved because of that relationship. And it may have nothing to do exactly with the technical part of your work, but being right. that number two for finance, yeah. for operations, it's an exciting place to be now. Yep. <laughs> you are a superstar. You have been on the podcast tour, showing up here, there, LinkedIn, et cetera. You were recently on a show. And one of the things you love to talk about is exit planning. So why is this so important? What are your thoughts on this? Because um, every CEO should be thinking about this in some way. So what's your view on this? Absolutely. So, you know, the old cliche, I'm sure you know, this is when's the best time to start planning for the exit from your business is the day you start right? What's the next best time to start it today, right? Because the point, and, and the point is, is, if you're always operating your business to be ready mm -hmm. to sell it to, you know, to an external buyer, who's going to come in and evaluate what's really going on in your business. Is this something that I want to buy? Is it something I value? If you're constantly operating from that mindset that that conversation, that, you know, proctology exam is going to happen at any time in your business, you just operate a better business, right? It just makes you better. So the idea of exit planning, and almost sometimes it's a little bit misnomer. I really just like to talk about it maybe in terms of what's the next chapter of business or success or whatever, because owners sometimes hear exit and they back away. They're like, oh, I'm not going to exit my business because mm -hmm. um, they think about it in kind of short term. I'm not, you know, but it really, it's, I should be thinking three, five, seven, ten 10 years out and kind of operating my business, you know, in that direction. You know, kind of the old cliche, you know, skate to where the puck is going, not where it is, right? If you know you're going to mm. business at some time, start operating like it's going to happen anytime. And so it's part and parcel to what we do. In fact, if, if you look at the Focus CFO website, you look at our mission statement, right off the bat, it says, we're there to help entrepreneurs build sustainable, transferable value in their business. And that transferable part is really the main aspect of that, because it, it only has value in the eyes of somebody who's going to buy it. So think about it from their perspective. Mm, so noble, <laughs> it's important. Tell me what it's like when working with a CEO of a company that's like either doesn't understand or says, no, I'm not ready. How do you get them from a place of, I'm not interested in talking about that right now. I'm in my, <laughs> I'm today mm -hmm. to you got them over the hump you started planning for that exit strategy and what was the feeling of that owner afterwards or where was the company position? Because I want to understand what that journey is for somebody that didn't believe in it to then somebody that accepted it and the benefits from it. 
great question. Probably the, the most effective way to have that conversation is to first talk about what's the owner's personal goals. Where do they want to be? What's what's what does their next chapter look like? I don't care how, what the time frame is, but what does it look like? You know, and it could be you know I want to be toes up on the beach and doing nothing, or it could be I want to be philanthropic. I want to travel with my family. Whatever their goals are, and then you back up and say, all right. Do you have your own personal financial plan? Do you know what you need to be able to live that lifestyle whenever you decide to do that? And hopefully the answer is they, they, they are working with a financial planner and they do know what their number is. And so let's just assume that they do. Like I need to have X, right? Or be able to live my next chapter. Well, if you sold the business today, what would you get right out of that? And the answer is it's usually a fraction of whatever that's going to be. Yeah. And usually they have, you know, all business owners have an inflated view of what their business is worth at that moment. But if we kind of talk about that in terms of what's the, the wealth gap, right? What do I need to do whatever I want to do next? What would I net out of it today? And usually there's this kind of gap. Mm -hmm. I'm like, all right, well, don't you think we should probably work in closing that gap? If you start with that conversation and you get them to kind of think about it in that terms, then it opens the door for them to be, all right, tell me what we need to be able to do to make this business better. And ultimately to make it more valuable so that I get there. And then you start working on your plan, three year, five year, whatever it is, to be able to get there. So as a fractional CFO, then what is it like to work with you? So you have those initial tough conversations. They realize they have a wealth gap or some kind of gap against mm -hmm. their goals. Then as a fractional leader, then what is, does it, so people understand what it looks like to be dropped into those businesses and work with them. How much do you work with them? How long are these assignments? What does that look like? Just so in case somebody's like, maybe I need one, they know what it's like. Um, well, I'll tell you how we work with, mm -hmm. with clients. Um, because, you know, the fractional space has exploded and there's lots of people are throwing, as you know, right, throwing fractional in front of whatever they think they do. Um, but for us and the way we approach is, is we actually, we, we modify, we say we're embedded fractional CFOs. And we use that word very deliberately because we seek to engage with clients where we will be embedded, our CFO will be embedded in that business on the leadership team as the CFO with the intention that it's going to be years to come. Our average relationship length with clients is like, I don't know, six years, something like that. It's, it's a long time. Um, but that kind of long-term mindset where the fractional CFO is just part of the leadership team sets the stage for us to be able to add value over a long period of time or extended period of time to get them where they want to go. It's not transactional. It's not you know, I, I have a project for you. Can you clean up my chart of accounts or look at my AR or whatever it is? It's not that mindset. It's we're adding a senior executive to our team who will help us be better and get to where we want to go over a period of quarters and years to get there. And that's that shift of mindset versus somebody may hire, you know, a C, an outsource CFO to do a project for three months. And that's why I'm so fond of the fact that I actually know a lot of people from the Focus CFO organization. I am just mm -hmm. waiting for the day, though. Somebody says, guess what, Deb? I'm embedded in the business, but gosh darn it, they need a fractional COO or a C chief quality officer. But I mean, that's what networking is all about here is just getting to know each other. We share a bit of your value with my audience, and um, you never know when the phone will ring. <laughs> but let's, um, I'm going to switch gears here a little bit. Rensselaer. Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Can, can, I don't know if I can remember that far back. Can you? Yeah, I, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I can barely remember, but I guess um, for other for people out there that don't know, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute's an amazing uh, technical university. Even though they do have arts and management, they're known for their engineering, their sciences. And I'm just curious because I haven't gone back there too much. Once I was done, I was done. But I mean, what are your best memories of Rensselaer? If you had to like share with anybody, what do you remember most, or what are you fond of? Um. Hmm. Or not? What, what's your worst horror story? Because <laughs> I could tell you, there's endless was, nights in the science center. In the... Yeah. Oh, it was. It was a lot of work. It was. <laughs> it was. Um. I had actually transferred there as a junior, uh -huh. so I had started out as a at, at a state university in New York. The you know, the degree to which I was intellectually challenged at RPI was so much. It was an order of magnitude greater than what it was. Um. And so 
I just, but it, it, it offered just this breadth of areas that I could dive into that wasn't really available in the state university that I was in. And so it, it, I, I relished the ability to dive in. You know, like I got into doing AI programming you know, almost 40 years ago when nobody was doing that kind of stuff. Um, you know, and explore that. And obviously the tools were very crude back then, but it was that kind of stuff to be able to kind of explore different aspects of it, mm. really, you know, get an idea of what I like, what I don't like, what's fun. That's not what fun along the way. That's so cool that you talk about that. Cause I too, I mean, I was smarty pants coming out of high school. Mm. I got into some good technical <clears throat> schools and then I dropped into RPI. I was like, oh my, am I going to make it pass this physics course or something? Right. It, it was just crazy. And then realizing, I think one of the things I realized though, was I had to collaborate with others in order to just survive. You could no longer get the good grades yourself, but you had to rely on study mm -hmm. groups. Very, very challenging and humbling, Absolutely. but I do remember it offered me an opportunity in their engineering lab to learn about robotics and automation, you know, right. using Fort Fortran programming language to <laughs> stack blocks or mix water and, and <clears throat> heat it up. Just that creation process of like, oh, that's manufacturing. That's the essence of it. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got the bug to get into manufacturing for which I've never turned back. That's kind of a part of my pedigree. That's terrific. Yeah. And I remember late nights. I remember hockey. I remember it's, anyway, a great institution, uh, grateful of going, having gone there. And um, if anybody's just wants to hear more about that, it's a really great school. So it's a great school. yeah. So coming back to you, Focus CFO. So tell me more about the organization. It's it just, uh, you know, local to North Carolina. Is it throughout the United States? Because I want people to check out the website and learn more because I think they pretty big, aren't they? There'd be so Focus is really one of the early pioneers in the whole fractional industry. Um, started doing fractional CFO things 23 years mm. ago. Okay. Right. So quite a long time. Started up in Columbus, Ohio, so close to you. Uh -huh. um, and but now we're a national firm. We're actually a national leader. I think we're the largest if you count by number of CFOs. We had like 35 percent growth in associates last year, which is the low. Mm. So it's just ex exploding, massive growth. Um, and I. You know, when I started with them three and a half years ago and really kind of was, you know, the tip of the spear as far as an expansion throughout the Southeast. And so I've been helping do that, you know, throughout the Carolinas and beyond. So it's a lot of fun. So you do business development and are you uh, embedded in the businesses? Do you play both roles or more business development side now? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm we separate the roles. So as you can imagine, CFOs by nature to generalize are not very good at business development or like it or <laughs> want to do that. Yeah. So that's one of the first things that helps grow is that we don't make them do their own business development. Mm. So we just embed our CFOs into the businesses and just be the best CFO you can for each one of your clients. Just do great work. We'll, we, my role, the area president, my 32 colleagues, um, we do everything else. So it's business mm. development. We develop our, our own, you know, referral networks and centers of influence and partnerships, um, do relationship management with the clients. So, you know, it's still a service delivery team going into it, um, but it's a lot of fun. And Focus is, I would call it very delivery. It's a mission-driven organization. We're here. If you don't have a passion for wanting to help small, mid-sized business owners just be better and have more successful outcomes, this is not the place. I mean, that's kind of like table stakes for joining the organization. But we have a dual mission because it's not only just for the business owners, but it's for all the CFOs that join us because this is their next chapter, last chapter, whatever you want to call it. And it's really an opportunity for folks of our vintage, right? Where we give them an opportunity to have their next and hopefully best chapter in a career. It's certainly my best chapter um, where they're moving from, let's say a, a, a career of, you know, they've all been successful, whatever they've done, but now they kind of feel like they're moving into a chapter where it's more of significance, where they're really paying it forward um, and they're able to help small businesses and and vice versa. The business owners truly, you know, we're, you know, let's say you're, you know, late fifties, early sixties, maybe in a large corporation, you're not that valued anymore or you're being pushed out here. You're highly valued by your clients because you're bringing a tremendous amount of experience and value to their business and helping them get to that, that next stage. So it's it's really kind of a win 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 scenario. And I love your use of the word vintage. Vintage at first I thought had a negative connotation, mm -hmm. but people will pay 
a lot of money for that bourbon, that wine, those I, fine things that get better with time. That's exactly who we are. <laughs> bourbon and CFOs, they both get better with age. And you know what? That's a marketing <laughs> marketing you message. Go. You better get that. So listen, this has been an amazing interview with you. Um, I think you should continue the podcast uh, tour because you're a great advocate, not only for yourself, but also for the C Focus CFO brand. I give you the stage one last time uh, to share any last thoughts with our audience. I just really enjoyed being able to share these stories. Sharing stories about what we do with our clients, to our clients and to our prospects is part of what we do, both the good and bad. Listen, I was a business owner. I have all the battle scars. I made lots of dumb decisions along the way. And sometimes, you know, maybe one more good decision than a bad decision. Being able to share that and so they don't feel like they're alone along the way um, and that there's help and there's a, you know, rainbow on the other side of it. I mean, all that is just so rewarding and quite frankly, a lot of fun. And it so, has been. Yeah. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> no, I was about to say, so we love to work with small business owners. If anybody is interested or you want to find out what a fractional CFO is all about, what it could potentially do for your business, focuscfo.com or reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to talk to everybody. And Michael, I am so grateful that you dropped in on the podcast. You were full of energy. I'm going to keep talking to you because I've got some thoughts here, but I just want to say thank you for being an amazing guest dropping in and I wish you, your colleagues, much success. Thank you. Thank you for having me join you. Enjoyed it. <laughs>